So, Berto, do you suffer from health anxiety? W- w- have you heard that I do? do Should you, I get that checked out? Do you suffer from it? Yeah. How so? Well, uh, throughout the years, I've had um, what I would call a bit of a hypochondriac tendencies. And when I feel like something might be wrong, I get really anxious and it can make, make me feel worse. Uh, and I've also had uh, actual panic attack before and I've had anxiety. And recently I had a, a very scary uh, case of this. Yeah. Yeah. And our, people might remember you discussing the floss incident. The floss incident, where yes. You, where you thought you had pooped out a tapeworm, when, a tapeworm, in, tapeworm, when yes. in fact you just put floss in the toilet. <laughs> the night before. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. So uh, I, I, let's get into your more recent event with health anxiety and panic. Uh, but first, let's do a little intro here. Let's do it. So... Uh, I put out an ask on Facebook for people to provide their own stories of health anxiety. And I thought I might get one or two responses. I got a lot of responses. Oh, really? For example, anonymous patron, she writes, I've suffered from hypochondria since I was around eight or nine years old. I'm 33 now. Um, After my elementary school showed us videos about HIV AIDS. After that, I became convinced that I had HIV AIDS. Whoa. At the time, I was being molested by my dad's friend. Oh. I feel that the two are connected, but I'm not a professional, so I don't really know. The abuse stopped around 10, but my hypochondria did not. Another movie I watched was about a girl with leg cancer who had to have her leg amputated. I I remember rubbing my left fibula bone at the time to check for cancer because I was so worried about it. The constant rubbing made it hurt, which re- reinforced my fear of uh, of leg cancer, right. which made me rub it more. I'll never forget sitting on my porch, rubbing my leg while crying, and my oldest brother looking at me with this weird expression on his face. <laughs> Over the years, my hypochondria has gotten better has gotten better than worse. Now, mostly in times of stress, does it come up more? My theory is that my anxious brain needs something to put that anxiety on, and it goes to health-related things. My family laughs about it. They tell me to go to the doctor, but I'm so afraid I'll actually be diagnosed with something. (laughs) It's good you are going to do an episode on hypochondria because some people think it's a joke when it can be very debilitating. Wow, yeah. Yeah, you know, people make fun of it. You even make fun of yourself right. in this process. And I think in certain situations, maybe it's okay to do for your sake sure. and maybe other people's sake to have a little laugh about it. But I do think that the needle has to be more balanced. We well, need, and, we need and, to like, right. take this seriously because it is a very, very serious condition. Absolutely. And I can say from experience that when you're in it, it's no fucking joke. Yeah. And uh, more to the point, and, and I'll talk more about this, like like experience I had recently, it it doesn't matter that it was in my head. It was terrible. Yeah. You know? Yeah, people make fun of it. Woody Allen uh, plays various characters with hypochondria, right? For example, in Hannah and her sisters, if you remember that one, I didn't see that. Oh, it's one of the one of the sort of quintessential Woody Allen movies. From I was the, afraid I would get sick from watching from the seventies. <laughs> uh, and his his hypochondria is played for laughs. Uh, uh, David Schwimmer's character in Madagascar. Oh yeah, the giraffe. Yeah, yeah. He's always you know worried about something, yes. and it and he's like the main comedic relief. Right. Uh, lots of stand-up routines. It's routines. All you have to do is go on YouTube and search, you know, hypochondria comedy on YouTube, sure. and there's just like uh, stand-up set <laughs> after stand-up set. Usually, men actually, which is interesting, women aren't usually the ones who are making jokes about their hypochondria, yeah. I, which I find curious. Why do you that think is that odd. is? I don't know because. Well, that is interesting because, like in my case, when when I was a kid, I wasn't a hypochondriac at all. My grandma was, and I think I, I kind of picked up that from her potentially. I remember my dad telling me like, "Oh, your your grandma is your your grandma's a hypochondriac." Blah 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 blah. And my dad was hyper sensitive to cleanliness, like everything had to be clean, and oh, don't don't eat that; it's been sitting out and stuff. Yeah. But I wasn't, so 
I don't know, like, you know, I, I never thought of it as like a male or a female thing. It was like... Yeah. But clearly in popular media, it's more of a of a male thing, at least in, I guess so. in movies and TV yeah. shows. Um, <clears throat> even though women probably statistically suffer from it more. By the way, uh, before going further, I just want to tell everyone that this episode is going to be for patrons only. So if you're not a patron, don't get angry later when we turn off the feed. <laughs> but um, also I want to say that this is an episode that is very near and dear to me as well. I, I suffer from health anxiety as well. And that this has been a very helpful process for me to explore. And mm. I've spent the past two or three weeks really getting into this and looking at the research and the treatment and thinking about my own path and, and observing other people's paths. Uh. And, and so, you know, I, I, I've, I, I don't think I've ever completed a set of notes with more satisfaction than I have at uh, this time because I have stories from people <laughs> on Facebook. Anyway, but yeah, I mean, I, I suspect it's funny for us to laugh at men with quote unquote hypochondria or health anxiety because men are supposed to be strong. And so it's this reversal if they're quote unquote weak, right? Right. They're scaredy cats. It's, it's funny. It's like the, the lion without courage in Wizard right. of Oz. It's, it's funny. It's like, oh, isn't that funny that that yeah. man is, is scared, you know? Right, right. Whereas oh, for a woman to be scared, it's like, it, culturally speaking, it's this expected thing. Well, women are weak, so of course they're scared. You know what I mean? Which, you know, it is actually really interesting you bring that up because if you think about it, the scarecrow has no brain. But that's sort of like what you would expect, right? The tin man has no heart. Well, that's what you would expect from a tin man. But the lion, the lion lacks courage. That's not what you expect from a, from a lion. Right. It's really weird. Right. <laughs> It'd be one thing if it was like a weasel that lacked courage. Yeah. Or Medical students and psychology students often, often laugh about getting hypochondria in graduate school. <laughs> it's actually a very frequent really? joke that Interesting. Uh, medical students and psychology students, when they learn about the conditions that they're learning about, yeah. everyone's like, oh my God, I have that, I have that. <laughs> And it's one of the things that any experienced instructor will start the quarter with or the term like, with. Don't worry. You're going right. to think you have this. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but again, it's played as a joke. It's like, haha, isn't that funny? Again, right. you can look on YouTube and find medical students and psychology students laughing about it. Mm. Um, so it's no joke. Like the patron emailing in, like I will attest to, like you will attest to, it's massive amounts of suffering. It is not fun. No. It is potentially lifelong suffering horribleness Ugh. and tension. And, you know, for a lot of people at best, they're just like managing it. Yeah. At best, they're just like only thinking about dying or contracting a disease yeah. 10 times a day <laughs> instead of 100, Ugh. you know? And this joking uh, culture, right? You know, because if you asked people without health anxiety, or even people with, what they thought about <laughs> health anxiety, they, I'm guessing, a lot of them would immediately, oh, it's hypochondria. Oh, yeah, it's you know, it's funny. You know, people worry about. This adds to the stigma. Sure, it, it doesn't help people who already are ashamed and not coming forward, who already beat themselves up. And honestly, it doesn't help the clinical world either, because right. I find that a lot of clinicians. We'll make jokes about it too, and we'll think of it as this silly thing that I'm being crazy. I should just right. Uh, I should just, get over it. Right. There's a sort of assumption that y you just just get over it. Just stop. You know. Stop it. it. As if it's not an actual condition in the DSM, right? And in, in which it is, uh, which we'll go into, and as if it's like, like imagine you're colorblind. It's like just stop it. Yeah. Or you have schizophrenia, or yeah. you have panic disorder, or you have major depression. Right. And of course, we have stigma around that too, and yeah. people will- uh, Cheer up. Yeah, just stop that. But I think, you know, comparatively, more people validate depression and OCD, maybe, hopefully, but maybe not And OCD. I think there's been more media over the years that deals with those topics in more serious ways. Right. I don't know that I've seen, I'm sure there is, but I don't remember like a lot of mainstream, like taking hypochondria seriously. Nothing know? vastly popular yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, 
And here's the facts that I found, which is actually surprising. So how, what percentage of people, particularly in the United States, suffer from full-blown diagnosable really? health anxiety DSM diagnosis? What, oh my what, gosh. what percentage do you think? Uh, 20%. Uh, 10%. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that's high, right? That's ridiculously high. I mean, one in 10? That's crazy. Like, you and I are one of the 10. So Th 35 million people? That's crazy. Right. So... It's one of the more common conditions one will suffer from at some point in their life. Wow. You know, and it is one of those things that tends to be lifelong, yeah. kind of comes and goes uh, in terms of symptom severity. And physicians often don't know what to do. They're often the people who, you know, medical people will be the first person to kind of experience it. Yeah. Um, you know, when they, su when they suspect that a patient is suffering from it, uh, in my experience and research shows most of them don't know what to do or mm. what they do do is not uh, entirely effective. Right. And there's huge costs on our society and our <sighs> mental health and our mental health and, you know, medical system, right? Sure. Like, I can't remember the stat, but s some estimates range it from 10 to 40% of our healthcare. Wow. Yeah. Because if, you know, 35 for, million. <laughs> because that's right. If you have 35 million people who sure. are going to the physician more often, 20 times more often yeah. th than they need to, yeah. then that's going to jack up the prices, right? And you can't always dismiss everything, right? Because what, what about if you missed the time they were actually sick? Right. So <clears throat> now there are answers. There are ways to treat this. Uh, and I actually, even in just prepping for this episode, you know, taking these notes and thinking about it, my health anxiety has decreased. Wow. Um, anxiety lends itself very much to knowledge. The cure yeah. has often been for people knowledge. It ha certainly has been for me. When yeah. I suffered from panic disorder in my early 20s, and when I went to graduate school and I took, you know, psychopathology, and I thought, I think I have panic disorder, uh -huh. it's because I indeed did. And just the fact that I learned it was a thing in the DSM, yeah. pretty much 95% of the disorder was gone. Like overnight. Right. Overnight. Right. Like, and, and, and I, with my anxiety as it manifests, and I like the way the anonymous patron writes it, you know, she's like, my theory is my anxious brain just needs something to put anxiety onto mm. and it goes to health related things. And that, that's the, what it's true for a lot of anxious people. You know, we tend to have these discrete labels, OCD, yeah. social anxiety, specific phobia, panic, health anxiety, um, generalized anxiety. You know, we have all these different labels, but for, in my experience, a lot of people a better label is just like, well, they have anxiety that manifests in these different labels, uh, you know, over time. Sure. Anyway. But yeah, there are answers. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about our own experiences. We're going to tell more stories <laughs> from Facebook and from Reddit that I actually found. I actually subscribe to the subreddit Health Anxiety. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, which is actually a good community. I'm going to, although it might trigger people maybe, anyway. We're going to talk about the definition, which is actually kind of interesting to talk about. We're going to go into the DSM diagnoses, the ICD diagnoses, common physical symptoms that crop up, which I found to be very interesting. Oh. You know, the, the typical physical sure. ailments that people with health anxiety will tend to experience, okay. which I found very familiar to me. We're going to talk about how do we assess it. We're going to assess ourselves. I'm going to give you an online test and nice. see where you are on the scale of things. We're going to talk about the theory. Why do people suffer this way? Why do people develop this? We're going to talk about risk factors. We're going to talk about a thing called cyberchondria, Whoa. which is, you know, internet hyperchondria. We're going to finish it up with, with some treatment and, again, some more stories from pe actual people suffering from health anxiety. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Humberto Castaña, and I make asbestos-lined Kleenex. This episode is just for patrons of the podcast, so if you are not a patron, this episode is going to end now. If you are a patron, you're going to hear this full episode, which I'm guessing will be at least a couple hours. So uh, if you're not a patron and you want to hear this full thing, go to patreon.com and become a patron. Do it now. <music> 